All right. So this is the, the last uh, of my three lectures. So it, every lecture I sort of give is a little bit different. So this one is different from all the things you have heard so far. Okay. So I'll try to go through the real basic stuff, because I myself is not really kind of a, a, a big expert on hierarchical structure formation in it. Uh, actually, Michael here, the director of the supercomputing center, is the expert, right? So but he's in the audience. He can correct me when I say something wrong. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is that uh, you see the knowledge progresses at, a, at an ever increasing pace. Uh, traditionally, how people try to model nuclear synthesis and chemical evolution, uh, you know, has to catch up with uh, the technology we are having now. In the old days, when people tried to do chemical evolution, it's extremely simple. They assume either say it's a closed box, and then you say, okay, stars will be formed at a certain rate. How many of these stars will be turning into supernova? And supernova modelers tell you that there are how many you know, different amounts of matter will, will come out and enrich the gas. And then you say that, OK, uniformly, these gas will be mixed in the box. You form the next generation of stars. And then you look at, say, like how the metallicity will change as a function of time in this way. That is obviously not the way we see the universe today. We know that the universe didn't, didn't just you know, uh, are evolving in this fixed box in this uh, very simplistic way. So we know that this uh, lambda CDM cosmology tells us that structure in the entire universe forms in a hierarchical way. What it means is that the smaller structures collapse first, become gravitationally bound, break away from the overall expansion of the universe. Then later on, these smaller collapsed structures merge with other smaller collapsed structure together into a larger one. And this process goes on and on until you get to larger and larger structures. Okay, so this is what hierarchical structure formation means. What I'm going to show you is a, a very kind of a, a typical cosmological simulation. This is taking out the co-moving part. Okay, I mean, taking out the ex general expansion part. Right? I'm just co-moving with the expanding universe. This is in the co-moving universe what you would see in terms of the hierarchical structure formation. You can see that the smaller pieces first collapses. They sort of like go together, become gravitationally bound. And then they merge together, become bigger structures. And you have seen this, uh, you can see the collapsing. right? And you also see that the, it always go along these filaments. right? And it, eventually, you can see that the, in the center, you get, get this uh, much bigger structure. So obviously, this is a very simplistic view of what exactly is happening out there. But at least you get the flavor of it, that this structure forms from combining smaller pieces into larger pieces. And a pictorial way to think about this is that this is so-called the merger tree. Okay? What you think about it is that when you start at early times, the time runs downward. So at the top of the figure, that's early times. You have very small collapse the halos. And as time goes on, these smaller halos attract each other by gravity. They come together and they combine into larger halos. right? And eventually, larger and larger things merge together. And at the end of the simulation, if you focus on one particular region, you get a bigger halo at the end. Okay? This is how, for example, the Milky Way was formed. Today, we see Milky Way, the total mass in terms of dark matter is about 10 to the 12 solar masses or so. When it was formed, I mean, it started from the very beginning. You have these very small branches of these little things uh, already existing in the general neighborhood of the Milky Way. But throughout the history, they merge together in this way. All right? So that's a picture. You say this is all nice, and it, you have very nice uh, computer graphics to show for it. Then do you have any observational evidence for it? And then you, just like after you have built a tall building. Again, you know, you always have debris left over. You know, these bricks and things like that, right? Scatter around. You know that it's a new construction site just to finish the building. So this is the Milky Way in the center. You know, we live in a disk, so this is the, the, the disk shape. And in addition to this disk shape, we already know that the Milky Way has a halo made of uh, stars, more or less going on in circular orbits, right? Going all around the Milky Way disk, and it, that's only the stellar halo. But we also know from the rotational curves, you, know, you measure cold gas very far away from the center of the Milky Way. You're from the Doppler shift, you know, especially the interesting thing is that the, the way we measure those kind of a, a, a rotational curve is using an interesting piece of atomic physics. 
hydrogen is everywhere, right? Everybody knows that 70% of the universe or a bit more is made of the hydrogen. So the hydrogen, if they are very, very way out there, sometimes you say, okay, uh, the temperature is too low there, you don't really excite the regular atomic levels anymore. Remember the atomic transitions of all the EV, right? So if the temperature is too low, you won't be able to excite those kind of lines. So what you would rely on, uh, some interesting quantum mechanical physics to measure how a hydrogen atom is moving way out there, it gotta be some line is not at the EV scale, right? And then you know that what is the lowest energy scale in the hydrogen atom? Lowest, yeah. What is, what is it? The lowest energy scale in the hydrogen atom, atomic physics, more or less. 21 centimeters. 21 centimeters. And that is coming from the nuclear spin and the electronic spin. If it flips over, you can calculate the energy of it. Basically, it's corresponding to 21 centimeters. So it's way out there. You can see it still. If it rotates around it, you figure out that it's Doppler shift, and you know that how fast it's moving. And you plot the curve of the rotational velocity as a function of the radius. You find out it doesn't follow the Kepler's law. If you know that everything is concentrated in the center, you know, you know the Kepler's uh, orbit, you find out that it goes down 1 over square root of r. But essentially, it's flat. You know there's a mass out there. From that and the you know, observations of the Milky Way and other galaxies, you find out that all these galaxies have this kind of a rotational curve. And that's obviously the first uh, real evidence for dark matter, right? There's got to be there. And we know that's there. So the Milky Way dark matter halo at least is of order 100 kiloparsecond. Okay? The size of the disk is only about 15 kiloparsecond. The dark matter halo is much more extended. Okay? And uh, around this dark matter halo, we find that these debris essentially left over from the formation of the Milky Way. And these are much smaller galaxies. Because they are small, you know the poetic sense come in, and they're all called the dwarfs, right? So these are called the dwarf spheroidal galaxies because the shape of these guys is actually pretty kind of spherical thing, all right? And uh, the names are all given here. And it, as you can see, it's about you know, 10 to 20 of these guys, okay? They, they are observed. We know these guys, essentially, they are left over of the formation process of this Milky Way. Okay, they are there. So this is a, a pretty good evidence that somehow the picture for hierarchical structure formation is quite correct. Now, that sort of, at least, you know, at the simple level, you see, this is how we do chemical evolution you should uh, respect. But somehow, if you want to understand anything about the galactic chemical evolution, you should understand how these little units were initially formed, then they come together, and then they become larger systems. And everything living in the larger system, like Milky Way today, you needed to consider this formation process, right? Otherwise, you are lacking a good theoretical framework. So now, in order to take on this new task, a little bit of new task, how I should modernize my way of thinking about chemical evolution onto this framework of cosmological hierarchical structure formation, you needed to know a few basic physics. And first of all, you say, if something has collapsed, become self-bound, gravitationally speaking, what we call it as a halo. Remember, most of the mass in these kind of a a uh, gravitationally bound system is dominated by dark matter, right? That's why we don't call it a, a regular galaxy yet. We just call it a halo. It's a dark matter halo. Now, for a halo, you needed to define its characteristics. The most important thing is its gravitational property, right? Because this guy, after all, is a supplier of gravitational binding for anything attracting to it, right? Eventually, you hope gas will fall into this gravitational potential and eventually condense and make stars and do all the chemical evolution for you, all right? So the gravitational property of this halo is very important. So how do you define its gravitational property? First of all, you need to know the mass of the halo. It's very important, okay? Then the rest of it is you need to know the size of it, okay? Now, all these very nice way to characterize the property of dark matter halo was laid out in this uh, very nice paper written by our director, <laughs> again, back in 1998. He used the cosmological simulations to calibrate these properties and to tell you that this is a nice way to describe them. The first thing you want to say is that, okay, I know the mass of a halo. How you wanted to describe its size? You gave it its radius. In order to know the radius, you needed to know the average density of this halo, right? Then you can figure out the radius from the simple, you know, uh, mass is equal density multiply the volume thing. 
So from the simulations, you find out if a halo claps at a certain redshift, the mean density inside this halo compared with the critical density of the universe at the time, it is about 200 times higher if this halo collapsed early enough. All right? There is some redshift dependence, but nevertheless, the, a, a few hundred is a typical number. So compared with the mean density of the universe, essentially, okay, a collapsed object becomes selfly bound. It's much, much denser. That's obviously sort of a straight, it intuitively very sounds right, right? But how large is it, this factor, it turns out to be about a few hundred, okay? And uh, the exact number for some simplistic model you, you, you can do yourself is that it's 18 pi squared, and that's where the, the, the 200 number coming from. So if you know, for a collapsed halo, the mean density is about a few hundred times the critical density of the universe at time, from that you can calculate its uh, radius, and that radius is sometimes called the virial radius, okay? Uh, uh, the exact name comes from, again, is this how this 18 pi squared is ob obtained from. So you know the radius, then you can define all sorts of uh, interesting properties. The first thing you can do, obviously, is a, as I said about the gravitation. Okay, all this dark matter will be bound together with this gravitational binding energy. Okay, that's not very important to us uh, to consider the gas physics. The more important to think about is that uh, how gas will be bound to this gravitational thing, right? All you have to do is that you find out what is the gravitational binding energy corresponding to the gas component. The gas component would be just multiply the fraction of the gas uh, of the entire total dark matter mass. So cosmologically speaking, on average, the gas to dark matter ratio is about 1 over 6, right? Okay, you know that. So that's this number. Then the other thing interesting is that when the gas comes into the system, Again, if the gas more or less it can be viewed as in some sort of hydrostatic configuration sit, sitting in this gravitational potential, then this kinetic energy by various theorem has to be comparable to its gravitational binding energy, right? And so the virial temperature you can essentially figure that the kinetic energy is comparable to each baryon would have in terms of its average binding energy, gravitational binding energy, so G, mass of the halo, and uh, the mass of the proton divided by the spheroid radius. That's its temperature, okay? And the, it's, the similar quantity would be the circular velocity. That's just the, the typical velocity for gas moving at this particular temperature, right? So these are the simple properties when you think about a dark matter halo. And how then this can help you understand the gas physics is illustrated with this simple example. During the first lecture, Joe, Joe Premack, he told you that there is a very nice relationship relating the total number of stars or total mass of stars you observe in these kind of galaxies today, the, the dwarf sphere orders, okay, the satellites of the Milky Way today. Those systems, if you observe as, the, as a whole, you find that total number or total mass of stars is typically of order, say, several thousand all the way to several ten million solar masses, okay? You see that they come in different sizes, varies about at least by four orders of magnitude. And you look at those stars. What is the typical metallicity, the amount of iron inside these stars, okay? It typically varies between minus 2.5, which is one over 300, the solar iron abundance, and up to about a tenth of a solar abundance. So that's only about a factor of 30 difference, okay? You say these are the two gross way for me to get the feel for how chemical evolution happened in these systems, right? The mass of the stars coming from that the halo was there being built, you know, as the dark matter just uh, uh, keep on accreting into this self-gravity bound object, it brings gas along with it, and gas eventually condensing into stars, stars turn into supernova, and the supernova start to produce metals. You can immediately see the total amount of star you're gonna form there gonna be related to the total amount of metals you're gonna see in these stars, yes? Okay, there gotta be a correlation. But the correlation now becomes very quantified. If you look at, it's about, I don't know, uh, more than a dozen of these dwarf spheroid galaxies over here. You, if you do the simplest naive fit, I take the least square fit, what you find out is that the logarithm of the stellar mass and the logarithm of this ion abundance is having this very tight linear correlation. The slope of the linear correlation is 2.5, okay? What uh, G 
Joe told you the exactly the opposite. He put the x, y axis in the opposite way. And, uh, and uh, nevertheless, the slope is 2.5. Okay? So my challenge to you to think about, how can you explain this slope of 2.5? It's not a random number anymore. It's now observed, right? And all you have to do is try to think about whatever the simple things we talked about, that these uh, systems come together by hierarchical structure formation. And the fact that uh, when you have stars, you have some of them turn into supernova and uh, produce metals and enrich the gas this way. And there should be a correlation. And in the end, somehow this 2.5 number jumps out at you, right? And that's some kind of understanding. Otherwise, this data is telling us quite a bit, but that we will not uh, be served very well just uh, staring at the data. So qualitatively, you say, if I have uh, more stars formed, you will enrich the system to higher metallicity. Makes sense, right? Everybody agree with that. But why quantitatively it has to be this way? It's not easy, right? Okay. So let's try it. Now, first of all, you understand that we are not into the minute details about how the detailed supernova individually blow off and how detailed the uh, process goes on to mix individual supernovas ejecta with the surrounding gas and how this process repeats all over this gaseous system. It's too complicated, right? Yeah. All we are doing here is try to make a global statement. The total amount of the metals inside the entire gas system associated with this little galaxy, right? And the total number of stars I'm going to form inside this galaxy. So I'm going to treat the system as a whole. Okay, forget about the details. So then you can write down very simple equations. You say the total amount of iron in this gas, how it changes as a function of time. You say, first of all, I have to think about how you make iron. So that's a production rate. So how many supernova you have in the system? Each supernova on average would produce, say, a tenth of a solar mass of iron. And so psi over here is the star formation rate. So Given how many stars will form per unit time, some fraction of it will turn into supernova, and each supernova will give you, say, a tenth of a solar mass of iron. So that's how you're going to determine this production rate for the iron. Okay? So psi t is the star formation rate. How many solar mass of stars you're going to form each year? Then how are you going to use up this iron? Okay? One way to use it is obviously, say, I'm going to lock them into stars. Right? You take it out of the gas. Then the other way of doing it is you actually blow out the gas. Because when the supernova happens, not only they enrich the surrounding gas, they can also put energy into the gas, make it hotter, so they might be able to escape away from this, uh, this gravitational potential of the dark matter. Right? So that's basically it. The way controlling the total amount of iron in the gas system is one is that how you are producing it. The other way is how you're going to take away this iron from the gas. So that, obviously, if you know all the details, you can solve this differential equation as a function of time pretty easily. Let's forget about that, because I'm going to use a piece of things I know today. The observational plot I showed you reflect the property you are observing about the present-day dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So this is as they are frozen in today, a snapshot, right? I also know that these dwarf zero galaxies have a, a common feature. They no longer have gas anymore. Okay? All the gas were used up. There's no gas, only stars in the system now. Okay? Now you say, how do I build up this guy? Initially, these uh, dark matter you know, gravitating to to towards each other piece by piece. Once the potential is set up, along with the gathering of the dark matter, the gas flows in piece by piece as well. So gas starts from zero and ended up being zero, right? It's a simple kind of initial and final state. How about I do an integral on the left-hand side from the initial process of the gathering of the, the system to the point where all the gas were used up? And I just do the integral on both sides. Then you immediately know if I integrate this dm fe dt from those two time snapshots, what you get? You get 
exactly a zero because the system is empty in the beginning and it's empty in the end, right? So I would immediately get a relationship between the total amount of iron I have produced by all the historical supernova inside the system to the, this integral of this iron mass fraction in the gas at any given time and doing the integral weighted by the star formation rate and the gas outflow rate, right? Now think about how gas outflow rate will depend on the property of, the, of this halo. One is that what is powering the gas outflow? It's powered by supernova, right? Because supernova gives it energy. So the outflow rate should be proportional to the supernova explosion energy on average per supernova. It will also be proportional to the star formation rate because star formation rate gives you the supernova rate. Yes? So that's the driver of this outflow. But you say how strong the outflow should be should also be countered by the gravitational potential you try to lift the gas out of. Correct? And then so the deeper the potential well, the smaller the outflow. So you would find out the actual outflow should be inversely proportional to the gravitational potential. The way you write that is it's going to be proportional to 1 over you know, gm over r virio, right? If I write it in this way, it will be just proportional to the virio radius divided by the mass of the halo. The bigger the halo mass, the smaller the outflow. Yes? Okay? So that is the zero sort of thing. And if you put in some numbers, a supernova typically put in 10 to the 51 ergs of energy into the system. And typically, the gravitational potential of these halos are very small. Okay? So you know that this number turns out eventually will be much larger than the typical star formation rate. So the gas in these small systems they are used up in two different ways. One is you stuck them into stars. The other one is you blow them out of the system. And because the system has a relatively shallow potential, most of the gas didn't get locked into stars. They actually get blown out. All right? So now you see that when I do this integral, I essentially can ignore this uh, psi of t in it. Now, star formation rate didn't use up so much of the gas because most of it lost it through outflows. So what you find out is that this integral really is a nice way of uh, defining an average. It's essentially the mass fraction of the iron in the gas system weighted by the star formation rate. Yes? Because uh, the F out is directly proportional to psi of the T. So you do that star formation rate weight, and uh, this iron uh, production rate you integrate over the time is just a direct statement of integrated star formation rate. So you divide it by the two, you're essentially getting from this equation a star formation weighted mass fraction of iron in the gas system. Correct? Okay? And that, because of this relationship between these two sides of the equation, you find out it's proportional to mass of the halo divided by the very radius of the halo. Okay? So that's a simple man <laughs> okay, simple way of thinking about the system. But it, if you have time to sit through these equations is the, the result you're going to get. Okay? So now you see that, that this star formation rate weighted mass fraction in the halo is exactly what you're going to measure. Because what you see is that how many stars you have in the system today. Each star will give you its uh, iron abundance when it was formed. And you sum up uh, weighted by how many stars formed at a different uh, these, uh, these, uh, mass fraction of the iron, you get the number which is here. And that's also what's plotted on the earlier plot. And uh, you now know, theoretically, somehow it has to be proportional to this number, the mass of the halo divided by the video radius. And I told you that uh, these systems collapse when the density is uh, typically a few hundred times the critical density of the universe at the time. So zero sort, you can say that the video radius is a cubic root of the mass. This is how you get that. So this mass fraction, you know, averaged over by the star formation history is going to be proportional to two-third power of the halo mass. The more massive the halo is, you tend to have a higher amount of uh, metal seen in these stars. Yes? Okay? So that is the first step. I still haven't related that to the amount of stars you're going to form in the system yet. 
The next thing is that now you only look at the gas, not forget about the metal. Look at the gas. We already know that gas change in three different ways. One is that it's been accreted from the surrounding intergalactic medium, right? Falling into the gravitational potential of the halo. So there is an infall rate, okay? It's F in. And you are using it up to form stars. So again, minus the star formation rate. You're also blowing it out of the halo. That's out flow rate. That's the only way, three ways you can dispose or think about how the gas mass is changing. I already said that the star formation rate compared with the outflow rate for these systems with shallow gravitational potentials is ignorable. You can ignore the star formation here because most of the gas was lost from the outflows. You do the same trick because I know the system initially formed with zero gas. Right now when I observe it, there's no more gas in it either. So I do the integral on both sides again. So integrate this side, integrate that side. The to this side becomes zero. So I know the total amount of gas fall into the system is equal to the sum of the star formation rate plus outflow rate integrated over this history. But because I already said outflow wins over the star formation rate by many factors, so you just ignore that part. Again, you get a very simple equation. The total amount of gas fall in got to be proportional to the total mass of the dark matter halo, correct? Because there's a cosmic mean ratio. Remember, dark matter is about six times more than the, the, the baryonic gas. So nevertheless, this guy on the left-hand side is just going to be proportional to the halo mass. Now, the outflow rate times dt, this thing is just going to be proportional to the integral of the star formation rate and the very radius divided by the mass of the halo. Star formation rate, when you integrate over time, it just gives you the total mass of the stars. Yes? And then you also have this R variable divided by MH over here. So this equation would give you the total amount of mass in stars you now see today in the system is proportional to the mass of the halo squared divided by the variable radius. You do the same thing again. Zero order, you say variable radius is cubic root of the mass you find out the total amount of mass I have formed in stars today in these systems goes as 5 third power of the halo mass. Now you see, the mass fraction of the iron is 2 thirds power. The stellar mass is 5 thirds power. It's the same thing as the mass fraction of the iron to the 5 halves power, which is exactly 2.5. And this is a what you see. Okay? So this is this kind of back of the envelope type thing you're supposed to learn how to do if you are trained as a PhD student. Okay? So I learned about this thing basically by reading Michael's paper <laughs> and try to understand how come this 2.5 slope comes about. Right? It doesn't take much to get that far. But now you want to say that, OK, if you look in details, these systems obviously don't exactly fall on the same line. They are scatters around, right? Then you go into the details. Say, individual system got to have its individual characteristics, right? The time exactly when it falls into the Milky Way and forms such a little system by itself got to be different from, for different systems. They might be able to explain all these scatters around this main trend. But the zero sort of thing, this you already can do, right? OK. No, no, very good. So uh, let me just comment on that. So what uh, Dan told you earlier when he showed you this uh, solar abundance pattern and uh, uh, telling you the different uh, regions of the uh, um, elements, uh, dominant contributors, are, uh, you know, which kind of sources. For the iron group, if you integrate over the history of the solar system, the dominant contributors are type 1A supernova because they contribute about two-thirds of the total iron in the solar system. And type 1A, as you say, that because they came from uh, the evolution of these low mass systems, their lifetime to evolve to that stage is longer, so delayed by about one giga year. But that, that does not mean that the, during the first giga year of the early universe, there's no iron source. Because type 2 supernova live much shorter lives, they can basically blow off and produce iron immediately. Except that their rate 
is, um, I should say, their total contribution when you integrate over the entire history before the solar system was formed is smaller than what you get from the later contribution by the type 1a. But they still contribute all the time. Right, so but I'm just saying in your equation, yes. formally there's a 2 minus behavior here. No, no, there's no such thing. Because all I'm relying here, the supernova I'm talking about is a core collapse supernova. So you have core collapse supernova happening all the time. Yeah, I yeah, see that I don't talk about it. Yes, exactly. That's the point. So I should have mentioned, made that much more forceful, right? Now you see that type 2 supernova coming from massive stars. They can start immediately right. when you form these stars, right? And also, that's the reason why I use the production rate that directly proportional to the star formation. There is no kind of correlation with the delay time and things like that, right? And likewise, I directly assume that, that the, 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 the outflow were driven by these guys immediately. Right? And uh, the additional contribution by the type 1a in these systems might again introduce additional scatter around the mean trend. But I think the zero sort of story that uh, these systems got to be dominated by the core collapse supernova for most part of their evolution. Otherwise, this correlation won't be that tight. Do we see the same correlation in silicon and magnesium? Yes. Uh, they, the data obviously is not as uh, exquisitely obtained. You might have uh, some systems have more stars observed into the silicon and the magnesium. But iron is universally observed for all these systems. That's the data w w which is more complete. And uh, I think uh, my student Chen Yuan is working on the other part of the, the correlation. The magnesium and silicon might uh, have some system, let's say ha half of these systems have the same data as well. All right. Are these stars from the dwarf galaxy around the Milky Way? Yes. So these. So those stars, uh, those galaxies, are, uh, dwarf galaxies, are basically uh, only have one core class and then everything's gone. No, no. It, it, the dark matter halo is quite steep, uh, quite deep. I will show you the, the, the other kind of. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. It's not like that. So what happens is that uh, typically the supernova first heat up the gas. It's not a so dramatic event. If the halo you, is extremely, say, um, shallow and your binding energy, let's say, come over here. If your binding energy, this is a total binding energy due to the, uh, the dark matter. If you multiply by the mass fraction of the gas, you can get to the, what's the total binding energy of the gas's uh, gravitational energy, right? If that energy is much smaller compared with 10 to the 51 erg, you're right. Pretty much that the one supernova will blow out most of the gas. But typically, that is not the case. The, 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 these, this thing would be maybe 10 times higher than the supernova. And uh, since it, you know, supernova don't come in rapid succession, so you won't be able to drive out all the gas in one kind of blow. What you do is that each supernova would heat up the gas to some kind of a higher temperature. And that as you see, that the, just think about how, how Earth's atmosphere you know, is like. Uh, it has some temperature. And we know that on the Earth, the atmosphere doesn't have hydrogen anymore, right? The universe was full of hydrogen. Okay, why you can't have hydrogen in Earth's atmosphere? Well, you think about the hydrogen has a very small mass. So its escape velocity is actually, I should say that its velocity corresponding with a temperature is actually quite large, correct? For a given temperature, the velocity of the hydrogen atom or hydrogen molecule will be the largest in the atmosphere. So over the time, this whole thing just escapes. And the same thing can be thought about in this process. You have a supernova blowing up, heat up the surrounding gas. The gas is very high temperature. So there is always some kind of a higher velocity portion of the gas atoms will escape away from the system. And this is how most of the gas were lost from the system. It's not like in one single blue. It's over a long time. The supernova continually putting in this thermal energy. And the thermal energy drives a wind-like thing, and it blows out of the system. Um, you're right, because as a function of time, the total amount of 
elements in the gas is increasing with time because you have more and more stars, right? I mean, the more and more the supernova contributions. And this record is preserved in the stars. A star formed at earlier times would have low concentration of uh, iron. If it forms later, the gas it samples has more supernova contributions, so its iron abundance gets increased. And the latest stars you form would have the highest iron abundance, right? So this is. Oh, that's uh, not uh, very important in the sense that the total amount of the gas is dominated by essentially hydrogen and helium content, right? Mm -hmm. The iron is only, say, like uh, in the sun, the mass fraction is only 10 to the minus 3. For these systems, the highest amount of iron is a tenth of uh, the solar. So it's 10 to the minus 4 solar mass is in these heavy elements. So most of the gas is always hydrogen and helium, right? Okay, so this is... Uh, Basically, the main story I want to tell you about, okay? Now, the other thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, if I can manage to at least get the basic idea across, is that it's nice for you to understand individual systems, right? Because you now even can understand some of the characteristics you observe are correlated with each other according to this very simple picture about how dark matter gathered together in this way and how its property can be defined in those terms. The other thing you want to know is that you really wanted to know the statistics. If this picture actually works to describe it, all the objects inside of the universe, statistically it should all make some sense. So how do you know how many, say, a million solar mass dark matter halos will be formed at any given redshift? How, relative to this 10 to the 6 solar mass scale, how many 100 million solar mass scale halo would be formed, right? That's statistics. And so cosmologically speaking, you can do this using numerical simulations, okay? That's what supercomputers are for these days, right? But uh, if you wanted to really think about uh, the physics of it and also try to apply it more easily to the problem of uh, galactic chemical evolution, you better have some simple qualitative picture, at least to get the overall picture right, okay? So this is a, a widely popular description of how hierarchical structure formation can be described using a statistical mean. It's called the press schechter formalism, okay? And I'm not so sure if you are the uh, first time that you heard about this. Okay, press is actually the guy, one of the authors of this numerical recipe, Bill Press, okay? Schechter is a Paul Schechter. He's uh, more like an astronomer. And these two people wrote a paper back in 1970s, like 1974 or so, right? And that paper has citations in the number of 3,700 citations also, okay? Some of them will be happy if you just get that many, uh, the total number of your papers, all right? But uh, he, one single paper, 3,700 citations. So what they proposed is this is a way to think about this problem, hierarchical structure formation in a statistical way, all right? Now, we know today the lambda CDM model would, based on this uh, inflationary scheme, you know the quantum fluctuation during the inflation would produce the seeds for the structure growth from the beginning, okay? So you know how the quantum fluctuations magnitude would be distributed according to different length scales, all right? So that's essentially what you started out. When the universe started from the real beginning, how the fluctuations will be distributed, you know, on different scales, you know, how its magnitude would depend on the length scale. And we also know how general relativity works, how gravity will grow these fluctuations especially in the linear regime, okay? So details you just uh, don't want to need to know. You know that it's possible. Starting from an initial density perturbation on different scales, applying the linear growth theory, you would say that according to the linear growth, how density fluctuation will be distributed today on different, different scales, right? Now that's the length scale problem, but you can also turn length scale into a mass scale by multiplying by the mean density and things like that, okay? So from the initial primordial density fluctuation on various different length scales, you would now, by this linear growth theory, to know on average, say like uh, on a certain mass scale, what is expected fluctuation, okay? You think about it, if you go to the largest mass scale, the fluctuation is very little, right? Because you smooth it out. But you zoom in, say on the clusters of galaxy scales, there's gotta be some fluctuation, okay? and you zoom in the galactic scale that's even larger, right? 
So that's the kind of a hierarchical structure formation in a statistical way, right? So from the primordial fluctuation spectrum on different scales, you applying linear growth theory, you get a statistical sense on different mass scales today, what is expected density fluctuation, okay? So these are all dimensionless numbers. You can see the density divided by the mean minus one, okay? And it's similarly over here. So that is a calculational process. Then you want to say, I know statistically these are the mean fluctuations and such. How do I think about how typical a particular system is, right? Relative to this statistical things, how typical is a system I see today? How should I associate it with the fluctuation in the early times, okay? And this, again, you do a simple model. I know that if I started out with an overdense region with uniform density, okay, break away from the rest of the system, I watch it under its own gravity when it all collapse to a singularity. This problem you can even do in, in basically freshman physics, okay? Think about a uniform density in a vacuum, okay, a sphere. And you start from zero velocity, it immediately starts to collapse. And you find out that within finite time, it collapses to infinite density, okay? So this process, you compare it with a linear perturbation in a, a proper expanding universe cosmology. You find out by applying the linear growth theory, an initial uniform density region will collapse to singularity when this uh, over density parameter becomes 1.686. Okay, so that's essentially the correspondence. Now you say the following thing. So if I apply my linear growth theory, if I expect this halo will collapse to form a self-bound system at redshift z, then my expected fluctuation associated with that system should grow to about 1.7 or so. Okay, so that's just the zeros of the theory. Now, this is the whole quantitative thing. From the primordial fluctuation spectrum and applying the linear growth theory, you can calculate the mean standard of these deviations of fluctuation on different mass scales. And this red curve shows the cold dark matter model, okay? As you can see that the fluctuation on very small scales today is very large. But on large scales, it's very small. Okay, you can even think that if it's below one, typically it's still in the linear growth regime, right? That's where the linear growth theorem, uh, the theory would apply the most. Okay, ignore these modifications of the spectrum by applying other kind of particle physics models to say there's a cutoff in the fluctuation growth and things like that. If you focus on the cold dark matter model, you know that statistically speaking, on these different mass scales, what is expected the density fluctuation? Now you say that if I want to see that, say, a halo typically, let's say, of 10 to the 13 solar mass or so, when would it be formed in this hierarchical structure formation picture? Or you have to say that when I start out with a initial density perturbation and by redshift z, this density perturbation by linear growth theory will grow to about 1.7, yes? That's the theory I just uh, sort of outlined earlier. So you look at this blue line that just gives you all these uh, growth of these uh, uh, over density things. So if I see today at redshift z equals zero, when this uh, delta over here will grow to about 1.7, so here's 1.7, and I know that this would be the mass scale which will be collapsing today. So that tells you a halo of the total dark matter mass about 10 to the 13 solar mass or so will be just collapsing today, okay? Now if you go earlier, let's say that uh, go to redshift 10, okay, a typical fluctuation would be collapsing at redshift 10, but the size of it is uh, extremely small. It's only about a thousand solar mass or so, okay? So from this, then you can essentially derive all these wonderful statistics, okay? You say that uh, assuming all these fluctuations will be Gaussianly distributed, okay? I have calculated all on different mass scales today what will be the mean standard deviation fluctuations. And I say that all the fluctuation possibly happening inside the universe is this delta, and the distribution of these deltas are Gaussian. And anything which has collapsed by a certain time 
mean, would mean that this density fluctuation has grown past this 1.7, would already end up in structures on a larger mass scale, right? And so you integrate over this, that give you the total fraction of the collapsed structure. And if you do the differential of it, you just get the distribution of uh, collapsed halos at different redshifts on different mass scales. And this is basically what press schechter formalism is about. Okay? So now, not only you know the individual halos statistical property, okay, using its virial radius and using its mass, you can do the simple kind of a analytical description I told you about related to the metallicity of this uh, stellar system versus the total stellar mass. You also know how statistically you can understand the growth of a typical dark matter halo and how many of them will be available for you to see at different redshifts red throughout the universe. Okay. Now, I'm going to jump to this particular diagram to illustrate again how you try to use this very simple scheme to understand another set of data points. Okay. What's shown here, again, are data for many, many systems. These systems are called damp lambda alpha galaxies or damp lambda alpha systems. What you see here is that you go look at towards high redshift, okay, as high as by redshift five or so. You find out that uh, these guys absorb uh, some lines of a uh, lambda alpha line of the hydrogen atom, okay? And by basically uh, looking at the absorption associated with that lambda alpha line, you also find out that at those redshifts, you know, there's also absorption in terms of iron and other elements. So you know that the same object not only absorbs hydrogen, it also absorbs iron and things like that. From that, you can get the ratio of uh, what the metallicity in that particular system is. And you know the redshift by that spectroscopic measurement at the same time. You know the iron abundance. So you can basically plot a data on this particular plot. What that, that say is that I have a galaxy already formed at that particular redshift. And its gas is enriched with this much iron abundance, right? So now it's a very different kind of a uh, system now. The dwarf spheroidal galaxies are a bit like archaeology on the Earth. So you are not going anywhere. All you can do is that go to different corners of the Earth. You can dig deep a hole, right? You find the different geological layers. This is the same thing as what we're doing with the, the dwarf spheroidals. But with these kind of damp lamma of galaxies, we are doing something extremely different. We are looking back in time. We are using the telescope as a time machine, right? You go far enough distance away, you're also traveling back in time, and you are observing some system forming at that distant time. And you are observing its gas system, how much iron it's being enriched with, okay? And as you can see, if you look at this plot, the zero sort of thing is that this is a scatter plot. It is no longer as neat as the one we have uh, seen before, right? There's no correlation whatsoever. You say, how are you supposed to make head and tail out of this, right? It's impossible. Well, no worry. First of all, you notice that there's some very simple things. One is that almost all of these systems have iron abundance above 10 to the minus 3. There's a flaw there. And you say, well, by the way, could it be this observational bias? Lower iron abundance is harder to measure, correct? Well, observers tell you, if there is a system with iron below 10 to the minus 3, say, as low as 10 to the minus 4, they are able to pick it out. So it's not the observational bias. It just reflects how these systems are enriched. Somehow, every one of them can have 10 to the minus 3 and above. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing here is that it's a scatter plot, but it does not scatter all the way to the top. Yes, there's an upper envelope there. Okay, so this is essentially the zero order thing you can came away with from looking at this system. First of all, all these guys somehow can be rapidly enriched beyond the iron abundance of minus three, right? F of h minus three. The other one is that no matter how fast you can enrich it it never can exceed some limit. Yes? Okay, that's the thing. The detailed distribution is obviously a bit 
more model dependent, and which I'll try to explain to you. So, you think about it, how you can model the chemical evolution now of this entire galaxy system in a bit more detail. The same equations I write for you before, I repeated over here. This is how the total amount of the gas is going to change as a function of time. You fall in because of the dark matter is gathering. And you use up in star formation, use up in this outflow. The amount of iron in the gas, similarly, I have explained it before. You can be a bit smarter, combine the two equations together. You just focus on how the mass fraction of iron is changing as a function of time in the system. You find out the mass fraction change as a function of time in this way. When is the production of iron per unit amount of gas? And then it is sort of like a being decreased in proportion to how much gas is falling in. OK? Now that's a bit interesting. Think about it. The first term is easy to understand. How much iron is being produced increases the amount of iron in the gas. Yes? What is the second term? It's a dilution term. Dilution happens because the fresh amount of gas falling into the dark matter halo, they don't have iron. They just dilute it away. Right? OK, so that's what it is. So now you have a very simple thing. You say, suppose now I really know this uh, iron production rate per unit of mass. Let's say it's some, some roughly constant, OK? Because uh, iron production rate is proportional to the star formation rate. Star formation rate is proportional to the amount of gas available. I can imagine this is more or less a constant thing, OK? And uh, the amount of gas which is falls in as the dark matter grows you know, in size, I can imagine cosmological model can tell me, right? So that thing is uh, from cosmological simulations. So how dark matter is bringing gas into the system as a function of time, OK? Then I can essentially solve this equation exactly, OK? And so before I go there, I can already make some simple observations. Suppose you do this process of enrichment you know, by supernova producing iron and by diluting the way by the infalling of the gas. You get some kind of quasi steady state, OK? Set this guy to be approximately 0. In this uh, balance of these two production terms and dilution terms, you expect that the average iron mass fraction at a given time will be the ratio of these two terms, OK? And this is essentially solving that equation in the diagrammatic, diagrammatic way, OK? Imagine you have a typical halo representing fluctuation, say, about one sigma level fluctuation, OK? You say that, that when you're going to start a formation, star formation, OK? Let's say that, that you started around, say, a redshift of 4 or so. Why you needed to start from that point? Because remember, in order to form stars, you need to make the gas collapse to a very dense object. And as the gas fall into the dark matter halo, it gets virialized. Virialized means that it requires some temperature, right? Temperature immediately provides pressure support. And if you have pressure support, you won't collapse. So in order to get rid of that pressure support, you have to be able to cool. Correct? How do you cool? Okay. Quantum mechanics comes in everywhere. The only way you get rid of energy is always making some transition about quantum levels. Yes? Now think about it, the primordial material, very low metallicity gas. What are you going to rely on to cool? Basically hydrogen. And the hydrogen, when at low temperatures, you can form molecules, hydrogen molecules. So imagine hydrogen molecules, how many quantum systems uh, you can build from it? A quantum kind of a level systems you can build from it. Hydrogen, one atom here, the other, other atom here. Each Hydrogen atom, you know how to describe, right? Everybody learn quantum mechanics, so you know you how to solve this Schrodinger equation to get the levels, OK? But two hydrogen atoms become a molecule, you suddenly acquire different degrees of freedom. You can vibrate, you can rotate, yes? Which energy levels have less spacing? Rotation or vibration? Rotation. And you actually can calculate it. The typical level spacing between the rotational energy levels, 
corresponding to a temperature about several hundred degrees. Okay? So if you are able to heat the gas about several hundred degrees, you can excite the rotational levels of the hydrogen molecules. And then this guy de-excite, it spit out a photon. The photon cannot be kept inside this dilute gas. It escapes, so this guy cools down. This is how you can start form stars. Okay? If you think that the temperature required for that to happen is about several hundred degrees, you know the halo has to grow to a certain size, right? Before you can start star formation. So that's what it means. And if you follow any of these halos, see it, how it grows, you know, according to this hierarchical structure formation, the initial phase of the growth is always extremely rapid. And that also shows that in this uh, iron abundance, that it just always goes very fast. Okay? And then you ended up in a quasi-steady state regime where the production of iron by the supernova is competitively countered by the dilution by the falling in of the gas. That's the quasi-steady state I told you about. So you always go in this. And it, in essence, if you take from typical growth history of these halos, the quasi-state value you're always going to get from iron is just by this curve. Okay? So essentially, all the halos at some stage will be following this quasi-steady state estimate. And then you say, this guy goes on like that. But eventually, this halo will become part of an even larger halo. Yes? And by that time, it's no longer independent anymore. So you say, you stop growing by yourself. Now you are part of somebody else. So this is where this info will stop. When info stops, this quasi-steady state no longer applies. And you just uh, pump up the iron abundance much quicker because you're no longer suffering dilution anymore. Right? Now here is what Michael was referring to. If you waited long enough, you're still growing, you have type 1a kick in. And here is the metallicity corresponding to that about minus 1 also. From that point on, you, in addition to the regular core collapse supernova, you also have the type 1a supernova helping you increase the iron. The iron abundance will increase even faster. Okay? So this is a zero sort of picture for us to understand this essentially scatter plot. Okay? So here is to say that, that you have formed a system which collapsed very early. So therefore, it's no longer suffering dilution anymore. The iron enrichment rate is simply the average rate you expect from type 2 supernova multiplied by the age of the universe. That's it. You've been enriching since Big Bang, and that's the upper limit. And for a 2 sigma halo, which is sort of a rare halo, this is how the evolution will be. For a 1 sigma halo, it will be this like. And it, if it's like 2 thirds of a sigma, it will be like that. So the entire regime of this data pretty much is telling you different density fluctuations when they collapse at different times, starting star formation at different times, they will follow these different histories of the growth of the iron. Okay? So again, I don't expect you to immediately understand what I was talking about here, but just giving you the flavor of it. So the most interesting thing to me is always about understanding. All right? So looking at the data like a scatter plot like this, you know, doesn't help you very much. If you somehow can put some kind of understanding into it, that is always a good improvement, right? So I'll stop right here. Okay. <laughs> they always are. Human beings are harder to explain. So I avoid that normally. So <laughs> I do science. I don't do social science. <laughs> okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Then a single hypernova would give you 10 to minus 3. Enough to blow mm -hmm. all the gas out of those little halos. 
Mm-hmm. Enrich it with heavy elements. And then when that gas falls back in and gets mixed with pristine gas, mm -hmm. voila, it comes out to 20 minus 30 kilos. This is essentially the same explanation you did. What we think about this is a prompt inventory. The yeah. prompt means it's the very yeah. first it starts, you just do it. Now no. And Mike, in that cycle, then you're going to lose some dark matter to the tail. Not much. Not much, yeah. I mean, why would you lose any? Well, I mean, you're you're, un you're taking away a lot of gas. Supposedly, that gas probably dominates the gravitational potential near the center. Well, your it, it would redistribute the dark matter near the center. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. it of course, the, but the indirect dark matter searches are, of course, very sensitive in lip annihilation to what the state of that dark matter spectrum is. I mean, there's a core. Very good. So when is the paper, was the paper published? Uh, 2012. 2012. I Large should look Gallup. it up. Okay, very good. Oh, birth of a galaxy. Birth of a galaxy. Okay, very good. The birth of a very small galaxy. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that really just reflects the initial stage of the enrichment, basically. Okay, very good. Yeah, okay. yeah. That, that was a heavy duty calculation because mm -hmm. you have to start with the pop two mini halo. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how large is the volume for the simulation? Uh, the one megapart sec. Okay, that's right. Okay, so, so we're how many? We're doing this in 100 cubic megaparsecs, you know, uh, where we have millions. <laughs> and how many of these halos hosting these uh, first uh, stars uh, you, ha you have in the system? A thousand. A thousand. Okay, that's statistically significant. That's very, very, very significant. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Track thousand mm -hmm. pop three forming mm -hmm. halos until they form a 10 to the 9 solar mass of four. Oh, love galaxy. Okay, that's very good. That's, that's very good. Super that, that's what I said. Yeah, but anyways, very good. So I can immediately observe that this is a floor, but you have to explain it with much harder <laughs> kind of a. Uh, is there a reference for all of this wonderful stuff that's just showed up? Uh, this one is in 2004 with Jerry Wasserberg. Yeah, the other one is 2012 with, with him as well. Okay. So, right, yeah. Thank you.